This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 833, recorded on November 23rd, 2021. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You're listening to the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today from Ann Arbor, Michigan, Kathy Spindler. Hi, everybody. Here it's 38 degrees, blue sky, no clouds. And what that is, according to the Norwegian weather app in Celsius, is three degrees. So it might not always match what the Fahrenheit is because that's a different weather app. But yeah, there we are. We have part four degrees Celsius, partly cloudy and windy. Get the little wind picture on the app. Also joining us from Western Massachusetts, Alan Dove. Good to be here. And it is 38 Fahrenheit, 3 Celsius. The National Weather Service site gives both numbers. So it's uh, same data being projected. And it's a little breezy, but uh, clear, rather pleasant fall day. Throughout November, December, and January, all donations made to Parasites Without Borders will be matched and donated back to Microbe TV. Well, not back. They'll be donated to Microbe TV. So go to ParasitesWithoutBorders.com and click Donate. Your donations there are tax deductible. And now that Microbe TV Inc. is an IRS-approved 501c3, any donations you have been making after November 15th are also U.S. federal tax deductible. So the reason to give to Parasites Without Borders through Parasites Without Borders now is that they will match it, right? Yeah, Double they it. will match it. Up to 40,000. Nice. And I said to Daniel the other day, what happens if you get more? He said, well, we might be nice. <laughs> 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 but he won't, usually doesn't tell me because then I would say, okay, stop sending there if we reach it, the match, right? And send it here. But it's too complicated. And just through January. And then for the rest of the next year, you can give to micro.tv Inc. And of course, if you're giving through PayPal and Patreon, as you already are, some of you, many of you already are, you, you, that's now deductible. So it's great. Yeah. It's very cool. And Kathy, you have an announcement about a PSA? No. Yes, a <laughs> PSA, public service announcement about a vaccine town hall. So a group of three people have gotten together and they're going to have a town hall on uh, December 9th at 7 Central Time, 8 Eastern Time. Andy Pekosh, Sabra Klein, and Erna Bird they're all from Johns Hopkins. And the topic is going to be about pregnancy and COVID-19 vaccines. So they think that there's been a lot of questions about that. And so if you know of people that have questions and they want to go to that kind of town hall, they should sign up uh, by going to asv.org slash education. So you can, I think I tried this once. I think you can even just Google for ASV town halls. And, and you get the right place. But asv.org slash education, December 9th. All right. For your pre-Turkey Day science fix, for those of you who celebrate it, many of you in the rest of the world. So the U.S. does. The, the thanks, the Thanksgiving in Canada is some other date, right? It's not yes. now? Yeah. If, it was already in October. Yeah, I think it, it happened in October. Well, it's nice colder day. up there. You know, it's autumn sooner. So they do Thanksgiving and sooner. Anyway. If you, if you need to wake up from that turkey. But uh, it, otherwise, two interesting papers today. Uh, the first is a, um, a perspective published in Science, dissecting the early COVID-19 cases in Wuhan. And they're not really dissecting no. <laughs> the people. They're trying to figure out what happened early on. Maybe not the best title. Yeah. Um, this is by Michael Warroby, who is at the University of Arizona. And um, I thought this would be interesting to chat about. It's uh, it's a two-page or so uh, perspective. It's his ideas on, on what's going on. And Michael Warroby is a known, a known uh, genomicist. He, he looks at sequences and makes conclusions. We talked about uh, one of his papers a while ago where he looked at some of the earliest HIV-1 sequences and figured out basically the sequence of transmissions from Africa, to, from Cameroon to Haiti, uh, New York, and eventually to uh, San Francisco. 
very interesting stuff. Um, and and so he's been doing this, of course, for the pandemic and the, all the isolates. So um, this opinion deals with the very earliest cases in Wuhan. And he starts out by saying um, there are a lot of key questions, including what about the earliest cases? That's what he largely talks about here. And he writes, it's very interesting, despite assertions to the contrary, it's now clear that mammals susceptible to coronaviruses, including raccoon dogs, were sold at the Huanan market and three other live animal markets in Wuhan before the pandemic. Now, you remember we did a paper about uh, wildlife sampling yep. in the markets, and they concluded there was no pangolins or bats being sold. Right. But the raccoon dogs were there, and the, the important were. part about that paper was that because they had gone in and uh, it was done completely independent of public health efforts, they were looking at wildlife trade, you know, as for its own sake, um, and they established relationships with the vendors, and that allowed them to see what was really being sold, even the stuff that was not supposed to be sold. Yeah, <laughs> and so, right, you know, there are regulations right. about these things. Um, but of course, you know, you could buy stuff that's a little off the books, and and they reported. Here's the list of stuff we we had in the market, um, which explains why the initial pronouncement from the Chinese government was that these were not being sold there because officially they weren't. They weren't. Yeah, yeah. And and so um, SARS CoV back in two thousand and three was found in raccoon dogs uh, during that outbreak, uh, and so and those were available in live meat markets. Uh, and and he says it's still not clear whether so there there are a lot of cases in Wuhan associated with this uh, Huanan market, and he says are these truly reflective of what happened or is it some kind of reporting bias? And he's he tries to get at that, and he actually does, I think, in his analysis. And the raccoon dog, by the way, is a it's an Asian species that is. It's neither the raccoon dog is neither a raccoon nor a dog. Discuss. Um, it's a it's a separate species in Asia. It looks a little like each of those things, um, but is not to be confused with either. Okay. All right. So this story begins on the thirtieth of December. The Wuhan Municipal Health Commission issued two emergency notices. This is for local hospitals that there were. Patients with unexplained pneumonia being seen, and they worked at some of them worked at the Huanan market. So they they put out uh, these notices and they say, "Hey, see if you have anything uh, related." So that the, uh, the the next day or the, the they looked at the Huanan market and found twenty seven patients that fit the description uh, that were in the market. Before you go too much further, I want to point out that although I haven't f ascertained whether this is open access, given that it it's a, yes. okay, then the figure S1, a supplemental figure, which is a timeline, is really great. Yeah. For I started to make my own and then I thought, maybe I should see what figure S1 One is. is. <laughs> it's a timeline. And I don't know if, Vincent, uh, if you have a way to share that, but um, anyway, so what's important as Vincent and we go through this is kind of paying attention to the dates. Uh, so December 29th was, or the 30th was when the announcement was made to look for cases. And then the 31st was when the reports came in of 27, I think you said, Vincent. All right. Right. 27 more patients. And 41 of these first patients were published. I think that was a New England Journal uh, the paper that we talked about, which said 66% of the earliest cases had a link, but not, you know, some of them did not. And so that threw some doubt into whether this market was actually the, the beginning or not. And he addresses that uh, in a bit. And, uh, and well, also, maybe this is a good point to introduce this. Um, there are multiple systems involved that will be that come into play in keeping track of this. Individual hospitals had people show up and some very sharp doctors picked up on, hey, this is something weird. Um, and there was there was one hospital where they actually had a couple of the, these cases come through and they 
they called a meeting and had their ID folks look at it and say, yeah, this is worth looking into. At the same time, there is this system that China, uh, that the, the government had set up, the Viral Pneumonia of Unknown Ete- Etiology, or VPUE, system. And the Chinese government was under the impression that the VPUE was tracking all this, but in fact, it was multiple groups tracking the information at once. And so there was, as can happen in a situation like this, you had some differences between who knew what and when. Um, as we'll Yeah, see. they say that the system didn't kick in until January 3rd, yeah. right? Yeah, and they, um, but they point out, you know, this the existence of this system is great. Other countries right. probably ought to have something like this. Yes, um, the do. only the only issue was that it is not well known, or I'm sure it is now, but it, at the time it was not well known. So the staff at these local hospitals who saw these cases didn't necessarily report it to that system yeah. immediately because they didn't even know that or think of that system. I often I said for a long time that it was that system that picked up these cases, but. He says here, it's no, it, it wasn't. It was, it was these hospitals and the sharp doctors, yeah, yeah <laughs> that picked it up. So these this paper with the 41 first cases, they were all transferred from other hospitals to Jin Yin Tan Hospital, which apparently is the premier infectious disease center there. All right. And so they, they formed the basis of that first New England Journal paper. Uh, but they were not <laughs> referred by... This VPUE, as Alan said, they were referred by the hospitals. And so he says, you know, the reporting about where the cases were from only began after these 41 patients were transferred. So uh, it's not likely that there was a disproportionate connection to the to the one on market. But he says we can actually go back before all of this by piecing together what happened in the hospitals, right? And he's, he f- first starts with the Hubei Provincial Hospital of Integrated Chinese and Western Medicine, which has an acronym almost as long as the name. It's so funny. H-P-H-I-C-W-M. H-P-H-I-C-W-M. <laughs> this Hello, was the H-P-H-I-C-W-M. First. <laughs> I hope you know. And they say this was not mentioned in the media, but they were the first to alert district, municipal, and provincial health authorities about these weird pneumonia cases, these unusual pneumonia cases. Uh, and Zhang Zhishen, who was director of respiratory and critical care medicine, on the 27th December, noticed an elderly couple that had ground glass opacities in images of their lungs, um, which were different from n- typical pneumo- viral pneumonia. He insisted that the couple's son also get a CT scan. The son had no symptoms. And the lesions were there as well. Yeah. <laughs> so, apparent- yeah, I was going to say, so pretty much single-handedly, this doctor, Zhang Shishen, uh, worked out that this was likely a new viral disease because this uh, strange, it's, unusual yes. presentation mm-hmm. and with asymptomatic presentation in the sun. That's very and interesting. And Zhang Shishen is female, by the way. Female, thank oh, you. Oh, okay, thanks. I wondered. Thank you. Yeah, I, as soon as I said he, I said, no, I shouldn't yeah. say that. Yeah. Okay. Um, so um, this husband and wife are what the, there was a WHO China report issued a, while, a long time ago. We talked about it. This is cluster one in their report, the earliest known case cluster, and the only one b- admitted by this 26th of December. They had no connection <laughs> to the Huanan market. It's very interesting. All right, so then another patient with similar ground glass opacities, he he or she worked at Huanan Market, was admitted to this hospital with the many letters on the 27th, December. So Zhang then reported these four cases, the three family and this new one, to uh, hospital officials, and they alerted the district CDC on the same day. Over the next two days, three more patients, all of whom worked at the Huanan market, were admitted, and they had the same kind of respiratory disease. So they brought together some experts. They had a meeting uh, on uh, the 29th of December. They just they said oh, something's really unusual, extraordinary here. Yes. And then some other hospitals 
started to see these patients. And so uh, they alerted the Wuhan and Hubei CDCs on the 29th of December. Uh, meanwhile, similar things are happening at Wuhan Central Hospital. And now we go back to 18th December. Um, the uh, director of the emergency department encountered her first unexplained pneumonia patient. It's a 65-year-old man who got sick on either the 13th or 15th December. And was a delivery man at one on market. He was a delivery man. And this is, so now this is earlier, showing up earlier than the cases that we just heard about at the multi-letter hospital. Um, On the 24th of December, a a bronchoalveolar lavage was taken from him sent to a metagenomic sequencing company, they identify a new coronavirus on the 26th of December. Yeah, to me, that's the most amazing thing. Yeah. (laughs) A new coronavirus on December 26th. Yeah. Right. Because we waited until January to find out that there's been some sequencing and it's a coronavirus. Yeah. Yeah, so that's when... So now this is somebody showed up, became ill, showed up at the hospital. Okay, so became ill the 13th or 15th of December, probably caught the virus a week or two before that. Um, So now we're going back to early December, somebody who caught the virus, who was a delivery man at the Wanon market. So by the 28th of December, this Wuhan Central Hospital had identified seven cases, four of them linked to the Wanon market. And Warby writes, these seven cases were figured out before the investigation at the Huanan market began. So building a case that there's no bias towards the market, right? right. These things were just reported. All right, another hospital, Zonyan Hospital, uh, which is 15 kilometers away from the Wuhan market on the other side of the Yangtze River. Uh, the vice president asked units to search for unexplained pneumonia cases and they found two. So this is December 31st. Word is getting around that we've got unexplained 31st. pneumonia in the city. The first uh, lived in this district, but worked at the Huanan Market. The second didn't work at the Huanan Market, but had friends who did, and they had visited his home. <laughs> <laughs> On 3rd of January, three more cases identified a, a family cluster unlinked to the market. So he says, clearly, it, hospitals in the first weeks of this outbreak are identifying cases with and without a known connection to the Huanan market. Um, so 10 of the 19 earliest cases were linked to the market, 53%. Uh, that's comparable to the Jin Yin Tens Hospital, 66%, and to the WHO China report uh, of 168 retrospectively identified cases across December, 33%. So he says these patients could not have been cherry-picked before anyone identified the market as an epidemiological factor, right? Yeah, nobody had made the connection to the market yet. These are people who are just showing up and, oh, okay, where do you work? Um, Right. And they're collecting the information without a bias. So he said there was a genuine preponderance of early cases associated with the market. So he said, why, why does this matter? <laughs> okay, let's talk about that. So this is what a lot of people focused on, and I did as well, but it was wrong. If the market was the source, why were only one-third or two-thirds linked to it? But he says, a really better question is, why would you expect them all to be linked <laughs> to the market, right? There's going to be a lot of asymptomatic 93% uh, of the people who catch this virus don't get sick enough to come to medical attention. Yeah, so you wouldn't have very shortly after it, it emerged in the market, you would have immediately not seen a link. So um, he he does think that uh, there is compelling evidence that community transmission started at the market. Uh, nevertheless, because we have so many early cases there, but yeah. you wouldn't expect all of them. If it did, you would not expect all of them to be there. That's the, that's the key. Yeah. Um, He also says the earliest known cases should not necessarily be expected to be the first infected or linked to the market. They probably were after the the spillover, whenever that happened, by some time. Um, And we have no idea. 
the index case, he says, is probably one of these 93% who never was hospitalized and could have been any of the hundreds of people who work there that had brief contact with these uh, infected animals. Yeah, given the asymptomatic rate or the minimally symptomatic rate with this virus, the first cases you see are certainly not the first cases infected. So we're two or more probably generations of virus uh, replication yep. out from the initial cases. And the fact that so many are still associated with the market at that point really kind of points to the market. Now he goes to this, um, the this, famous earliest case. This, this is, is a really critical part of this article that actually got, got a good bit of coverage already, I think, and probably needs more. So the supposed mm -hmm. earliest case is a 41-year-old male accountant. He lived, he lived 30 kilometers south of the market, had no connection to the market. And his illness onset was reported on 8th of December. Apparently now he actually didn't get COVID till much later. The 8th December illness was a dental problem for which he went to the hospital. <laughs> and so uh, he uh, got um, the COVID onset date was actually the 16th of December, not the 8th. And he was probably infected um, after the virus was already spreading through the market. And he said he thought he might be infected either in the subway or at the hospital. Yeah. So he's not the earliest case. Um, in fact, Warby says his symptoms came after multiple case workers at the market, uh, making a female seafood vendor there the earliest known case with illness onset on 11th of December. Interesting. And she so reported December. knowing of several possible cases that were near the market right. from that time frame. December 11th. December, actually, and... Uh, some some one on market patients were hospitalized at Union Hospital as early as 10th December. And all that's on the timeline. Yeah, the timeline is great. Yeah. <laughs> so, as we already said, it was this HPHI CWM <laughs> that identified the outbreak and the market connection, not the VPUE mechanism. And this is also interesting. National officials reportedly did not learn about the outbreak until George Gao found in online group chats about these emergency notices from the hospital, the Wuhan uh, hospital. So he then notified the National Health Commission. So nobody knew outside of Wuhan yeah. <laughs> till this point. So much for that mechanism, right? So that, that's, um, that's is, this is where he says, you know, the VPU didn't work, but it's a really good idea. We should commend China for having it and we should just fix it. And as Alan said, we should make sure every country has such a... a uh, uh, system for and it, for and it highlights right? the difficulty of um, setting up and getting a system like that used when there's no pandemic, because most yeah. of the time yeah. this is something that nobody needs to think about. You know, it's of unknown etiology. Well, in the ordinary practice of medicine, you know, there's the saying: if you hear hoofbeats, don't look for zebras. Um, so if somebody shows up with viral pneumonia, yeah, okay, you know, another one of these. Um, but then in this extraordinary circumstance, you need them to think of, oh, we should notify the VPUE. And so it's a it's a publicity problem, really, more than anything else. So then he talks a little bit about genomics. Um, as we discussed with, uh, what was his name from uh, New Orleans? Anyway, oh, I can't remember. Uh, uh, <laughs> Bob? Bob yeah, something. Robert, Bob, yeah. Bob Gary, Robert Gary. Bob yes. Gary. Right. Uh, <laughs> Two first <as> names. <laughs> Dixon would say, my Rolodex is moving slowly. <laughs> um, so this, we there were two lineages from the sequencing early on in uh, the sequences from Wuhan patients, right? A and B, they're called. And he argues that because this elderly couple, the first one with no connection to the Huanan market, uh, the illness onset, 26 December, they must be the source of the earliest lineage A. That's what the WHO called, um, you know, cohort one or whatever it was. So the guy, uh, the guy's sequence is has been uh, depositive, and he probably got that from his wife who got ill a day late, uh, earlier. And they... They were not connected to the Huanan market, but they had visited the Yang Chahu market. That's right. Which is another live animal market. Then 
So it's possible that there were two spillover events. Yeah. Um, yes. Maybe. And Bob, and Bob Gary did say that as yeah. well. He said there were most likely multiple spillover events. Yeah. Um, and in fact, he, he spec, Michael speculates that there may have been separate spillovers of both A and B lineages. Yeah. Right. Um, how, but he says the, the earliest known A lineage has a close geographical connection to the Huanan market. Um, so um, he believes if lineage A had a separate origin from B, they both occurred at the Huanan market. Um, and the association with Yang Cha Hu, which does not sell live mammals, is probably due to community transmission. Oh, right. Yes. Right. Yeah. So no, anim- I got no that mammals wrong. there. Right. Yeah. I forgot about that. Now, here's an interesting factoid for you all. Many of you probably know this already. For, for the original SARS, the market sold, in fact, an animal for a long time because yes. it wasn't uh, clear what was going on right away, right? So that made it easy to sample animals and see multiple jumps into humans. But for this one, the market was closed. The Juana market was closed on January 1st and disinfected and all the animals removed. Because it's based on the lessons of SARS, as soon yeah. as it emerged, you know, once they once they got the systems working and collated all the data and said, oh, a lot of these people are connected to this market, shut the market. Yeah. So we don't have any animals. No live mammal collected at the market or any other market in Wuhan has been screened for yeah. SARS-CoV-2 related viruses. So the lesson for the next pandemic is yes, shut the market. We learned that from SARS and that was done in this case, may, may have saved us from additional spillovers. But when you're shutting the market, collect the live animals and sample them. Yeah, they should collect them, yeah, for yeah. sure. So Michael Warby says, nevertheless, the earliest symptom Symptomatic cases were linked to the Huanan market, and he says specifically to the western section where they caged raccoon dogs. Now, we had, remember the three people from the WHO committee yep. on TWIV? And I asked Dashak, there seem to be a lot of cases here. What does that mean? He said, oh, probably nothing. <laughs> and I think this is what it was. Yeah. <laughs> this western area where the raccoon dogs were caged. I guess he didn't know that. So, but it, on the map of the market, which was in the report, you can see one part has all I remember the. Remember that? Yeah. yeah. Um, but I guess he didn't know that the do- the raccoon dogs were there's, there. Speaking of maps, there's a good one in this article too um, that shows where uh, the Huanan market is, where the clusters are, where the cases are with known associations to the market, the cases mm-hmm. with no identified link to the market, which are all nonetheless, you know. Uh, not all, but many of them are nonetheless clustered in the same neighborhood. You can imagine people going to restaurants in the same neighborhood. We know the virus spreads pretty well there. Uh, they also put the Wuhan Institute of Virology, both campuses on here, um, which are on the opposite <laughs> side of the river and not around clusters of cases, in case you're wondering. Right. So he said, you know, we may never um, get these viruses from animals, but we could review... Uh, the spatial patterns of cases, like he's done additional genomic data, uh, and maybe we could get a better idea of uh, the origin. So obviously he he thinks the, the evidence su- supports one on market. Yeah. Makes, I think it makes a lot of sense looking at this timeline, right? Yeah, this, ad- this adds up pretty clearly. And the idea of associated community spread and asymptomatic infections. Yeah. Yes. All of those combined to give us a picture that was not very clear then, not very clear in the interim, and now starting to have some pieces that are making some sense, I think. Yeah. And these cases that were in that first 41 case report, those were well after the whole thing started, right? So the, yeah. as he said, that is long gone because just because they're not all of them at the market doesn't mean anything anymore. So I thought that was very nice. Thank you, Michael Warby. Yes. I did ask Michael to come on TWIV a long time ago, a couple of months ago, and he said he was too busy. <laughs> okay, I guess he was writing this paper. Yes. <laughs> All right. Um, hang on a second here. I lost my paper. All right, so the next paper, we're going to go away from SARS-CoV-2 uh, and, in fact, away from any 
coronavirus because I saw this when it came out and I just said, this has got to be done. This is it's really beautiful. <laughs> this is really, yeah. really something. And it's a DNA virus. Yes, it's, it's a, a DNA, DNA virus. virus. Yes. We've got to, got to try and yep. be diverse. DNA here. virus, which we're trying to do. You know, we did the vaccinia, yeah. remember the, the Viking vaccinia and stuff. So, yeah. And was that the last DNA virus we did? I don't remember. Well, we recently did vaccinia, so probably. That was, probably yeah, was. That was it. Anyway, this is a Nature article. Herpes viruses assimilate kinesin to produce motorized viral particles. And that motorized particles. They got Motor wheels, they got engines. Motorized <laughs> particles. And just from the title, you've got to look at this paper. Uh, Caitlin Pegg, Sophia Zajcik, I think are the co-firsts, right? I think. I saw that. It's all at the end. Oh, here we go. Yes. Ten. Caitlin yes. Pegg yeah. and Sophia Zajcik. From uh, Northwestern University, and um, Greg Smith is the uh, last author. Um, and Greg was on TWIV a long time ago. I don't remember. I, I didn't look it up. Um, so this is out of his laboratory. So herpes viruses, envelope DNA viruses. There's a membrane with a lot of glycoproteins in it, different ones, and inside is a nucleocapsid, icosahedral nucleocapsid, which contains the double-stranded DNA. And I have a cool keychain of that. I have three, actually, because independent people have given them to me. It's on the other desk. Um, so when these viruses infect cells, the membrane fuses at the plasma membrane, and then the nucleocapsid comes out and it gets on microtubules and motors to the nucleus, where it then puts its DNA, okay? And the when the new viruses are made, they motor out towards the plasma membrane on a, using another motor, because microtubules move things from plasma membrane to nucleus using different motors. The cell has and a railroad inside. The cell has a railroad. So I cannot remember... These, so I had to write them down. Yes. Dynein is one of these motors that <laughs> goes towards the nucleus. Mm -hmm. And kinesins move things towards the periphery. Right. But it's not black and white, as you'll see. <laughs> not always black and white. And so this happens, you know, when herpes viruses initially infect you, they infect the respiratory mucosal epithelial cells. And they enter those cells. They reproduce the new particles come out, and then they infect sensory nerve endings, and the virus then travels to the nerve body, which is typically in a, a peripheral ganglion, and that's also by microtubule-mediated motoring. Right. So herpes and, does a lot of traveling for a virus. It it moves itself in an individual <laughs> cell infection. It's going to move itself from the membrane toward the nucleus to get its genome into the nucleus, and then it's going to move its particles out, and then... On a larger scale, it moves along neurons to get to where it's going to hide out and lie dormant and latent until it reactivates. And then, when, of course, when it reactivates, then it moves right. down the axon again to the end, to the sensory endings, and then is released and gives you a cold sore. So herpes whatever. has complex transportation needs. And, and you didn't even talk about how when it's getting out of the cell, it... Gets a membrane, loses a membrane, gets a membrane, loses uh, so a membrane. Cool. Yeah. Something like that. But yeah, it's amazing. And it starts getting a membrane at the nuclear membrane, then loses and gains. It's very cool. Yeah. Oh, and by the way, this paper <sighs> is in Nature and it is not open access. Sorry. Um, and in, in typical Nature style, it's extremely terse. There's a huge yes. amount of data here. And every sentence has like... 20 experiments buried. It's just very hard, I find. Mm -hmm. I had to read this many times. The text and is I asked, four printed pages plus references and such. And then it's just every single sentence is, you know, see supplementary data, see this, see that, see that. And and you piece through bits and pieces. And yeah, I had to read it multiple times to get it. <laughs> to, to that point, um, the first six figures... And the first supplementary video are all supplementary. Yes. Right, right. You, I mean, yeah. in an ordinary paper, the first figure would be in the paper. Yes. Not a supplement. Yes, it's very strange. All right, so th there are two herpes viruses being studied here. The one is herpes simplex type 1. 
the human virus. And then there's pseudorabies virus, uh, which is an animal, uh, I think it's a swine virus. Um, and it is used as a model in uh, laboratories. So, so Greg uh, did his postdoc with Lynn Enquist, who studies pseudorabies virus as a model to study this kind of trafficking. And Greg has now gone out on his own, and, and Lynn is in Arizona moving pebbles around, apparently. <laughs> um, but um, it's a model. And we go back and forth between the two models. So there is, to start this off, there is a protein encoded in the genome of both of these viruses called UL36, okay? And this, um, this protein binds dynein and allows centripetal transport, which means away from the nucleus, right? No, towards the nucleus. Centripetal is seeking, peta is seeking, fuga is fleeing. So centrifugal is out, right? Mm-hmm. Okay, so centripetal towards the nucleus. So VL, v, UL36 binds dynein, and that helps to get the uh, uh, capsid towards the nucleus as the virus is first uh, infecting a cell. So, and you have to remember that the these proteins are located between the nuclear capsid and the membrane. There's an there's an area called the tegument, which is full of proteins, and um, this is one of them. It's in there. So when the uh, membrane is lost at the plasma membrane, then you have the nuclear capsid with all these proteins bound to it. All right, so this binds dynein. Um, they were studying this protein on its own, taking and, and they, they found that if you remove this, the C-terminus, which is the part of the protein that binds the capsid of the virus, the, the protein moves in both directions. It doesn't just move towards the nucleus. It also moves towards the plasma membrane. So they said, well, that must mean that, and these are all supplementary figures yes. and videos. <laughs> but, but Vincent, I'm a little confused because you said it binds dynein, but it also binds kinesin. And most of those supplementary figures are about binding kinesin, right? Right. But he first says it binds dynein, right? And then he said, but when we took off the C-terminus, the movement was bidirectional. Okay. Okay. Right. Which implied that it's bi also binding kinesin, right? And then they spend the rest of the time talking looking about at that. Right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I, so, you know, the, the old literature is it binds dynein, but now but in, in their manipulations of the protein, they found that it, it binds kinesin. Yeah. So uh, they mapped the part of the PUL36 that binds kinesin. And I mean, this is a huge figure with many, many <laughs> variant proteins and immunofluorescent. But it's important for you to understand what happens next. So there are motifs in UL36. They're called WD motifs, tryptophan aspartate. And yes, there is one in another protein, not this one, called the WD40 yes. motif, <laughs> which I've always loved because I use WD40 all the time. Anyway, there are four WD motifs in this protein. Um, Three, one and two, you don't need for this kinesin movement. Three, a little bit, and four is totally, completely essential for kinesin-mediated movement. And so they tried to remove four, WD4 from the virus, but it, they couldn't get infectious virus out. Probably makes sense. So what they did instead was to tweak both WD3 and four in a way that allowed them to get uh, a virus and, and studied uh, then they could study its transport. Okay, so now they have a virus that doesn't bind kinesin very well because of these changes in UL36. Um, and when you infect primary sensory neurons in culture, um, these are made from... Um, okay, primary sensory neurons are infecting with this mutant that is reduced in its ability to bind kinesin, doesn't make it to the nucleus. It, hang, it hangs up on the juxtanuclear cytoplasm. I love that. Right, right near the nucleus. And they never get, never get the DNA into the nucleus. So they say this must mean that kinesin binding by UL36 is important for getting the particles to the nucleus during infection, which wasn't known, right? This, right. Is, this is something new. 
Okay, so kinesin is important. Let's let's dissect this a little more. So they have cells that don't have kinesin. All right, they have uh, human retinal pigmented epithelial cells. They've knocked out one the one isoform of kinesin. These are called KIFs, kinesin isoforms, and there's three of them. But this cell only has one, and they can knock it out. And when they infect cells, this time with herpes simplex virus, the wild type cells, the, the capsids go right around the nucleus. They use the word decorating the nuclear rim. Yes. Isn't that yes. lovely? <laughs> mm -hmm. Just in time for the holidays. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> and this, uh, the, the cells that don't have KIF adjust the nuclear position, not at the nucleus, but uh, actually, it's near the centrosome, which is a, a ways away from the, the nucleus. So both experiments, changing the virus so it can't bind kinesin very well, and then changing the cells to eliminate kinesin, the virus can't get into the nucleus. Everybody good with that so far? Yep. And the figures are very beautiful, and especially the summary figure, which explains it all, but unfortunately it's not open access. Yeah. Um, they They... Do, do the same experiments in, in fibroblasts. They knock down KIF, get the same phenotype. Kinesin apparently, apparently is important for getting capsids to the nucleus. However, they say we're puzzled because this, this UL36 that doesn't bind kinesin, we can't grow it up. What, what's the problem? It should be able to do that. So they thought maybe actually kinesin is in the virus particle. This, this is how they, they got this idea. So they grew up herpes simplex viruses in cells that don't produce the kinesin. Okay? Yep. And then they use that virus to infect new cells. And guess what? Centrosome to nucleus trafficking is impaired. The virus hangs up at the centrosome like it did before. So if you grow the virus in kinesin-deficient cells and then infect kinesin kinesin deficient cells virus doesn't make it to the nucleus so they say oh there must be a motor in the virus particle that must have been a cool day yeah right? oh my gosh okay so so uh how do they they do this they took um let's see the, they took these viruses grown so both herpes simplex and pseudorabies grown in cells without Kinesin, okay? They grow really well, actually. They say, actually, they grow better than grow better. <laughs> in, in other cells, and we don't know why. But they make small plaques, and they're not neuroinvasive in mice, which means if you inoculate at the periphery, they don't get into the nervous system. So this is without kinesin, right? Because right. the viruses were grown in cells that lack kinesin. So they, um, and again, the, the, these viruses don't get into the nucleus. They, they accumulate around the nucleus, around the centrosomes. Okay. Now, even if you, this is very interesting. If you take these viruses grown in kinesin minus cells, and then you infect kinesin producing cells, still have a defect. They so have to come in with kinesin. To have the particles have to have kinesin in them, exactly. So based on all these data, they said, oh, this, there has to be some kinesin, so let's find it. So they purified particles and did Western blots with antibodies. No dice. They couldn't see any kinesin. They said, maybe there's not enough. So uh, what they did is very clever. They took kinesin in the cell, and they fused it, they fused the gene to beta-lactamase, a bacterial, a gene encoding a bacterial protein that's been used for ages to look at blue plaques. So beta-lactamase will convert a chromogenic substrate to something with a color like blue. Beta-lactamase goes back to, to your early papers in the 10 molecular biology yes. papers. Yes, <laughs> right. that's right. So it's a bacterial protein that's studied extensively in bacteria, but also can be used in uh, eukaryotic cells as a reporter. So they fused and it. By the way, every time I drive down I-84 through Connecticut, there's this big billboard 
for for <laughs> a restaurant called Blue Colony Diner. And I can't go past that billboard <laughs> without funny. thinking of beta lactamase because you get yeah. blue, if you have bacteria with it, you get blue colonies on the appropriate yeah. calorimetric plate. That's great. You should go in and tell them. You know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> probably people have. I think probably Maybe. somebody must have. Blue colony, blue colony diner. diner. That's just great. Oh, wouldn't it be funny if you went in and he said, "Yeah, I'm, I'm an out of work molecular biologist. <laughs> 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 I couldn't get a job. That's why I'm here." Um, so they fused. The kinesin in the cell with this beta lactamase. And of course, then they grow virus in this. And the idea being that that's going to be incorporated. Uh, and then they can look to see if there's a signal. And in fact, so they add a substrate to the virus particles. And it's a, some fancy new way of doing it, not the old way, <laughs> but they can see that there's beta lactamase in the particles. It's in the cell as well. Um, and then they can do mass spec and see it. Um, and they can use it also, the, they, they concentrated the preparation in a specific way. And then finally, they could see the kinesin uh, in the virus particles. So it's in there, but there's not a lot of it, yeah, which so makes this, sense because you really don't need that much, right? You just, this is, yeah, a, yeah. this just has to pull the particle around. Yeah, you need a, probably just a couple of motors per particle, yeah. right? But this this method, I think, was really important, right? This whole idea of putting lactamase in and then um, it, it, concentrating it to do the mass spec. So they said, uh, we enrich for proteins in the range of a certain size, which this, this heavy chain is pretty big. And they did mass spec and they were able to see it. So uh, I have a sense it took a long time to do that. Yeah. Right? <laughs> All right. So then they said... Okay, so what we think is happening is these viruses capture kinesin and then use it to infect cells, and that would include neurons. So they, they tested this with herpes simplex. Um, and this is also very clever. So they grew herpes simplex virus in cells that produce a version of, of kinesin with an inducible dimerization domain. <laughs> so you can add a drug to the cell and it will dimerize kinesin and it will freeze wherever it is. It won't go. Can we make a train analogy, Alan? Oh, yeah. I guess you're, you're hitting the red signal or something here. <clears throat> it's just train is stopping for some, maybe the, the, the wheels are frozen. Right. And so they can infect, so they say, cross-links the two heavy chains of the motor, rendering it immobile on the tracks. <laughs> And in fact, that's what they see. They have these beautiful figures where they infect these primary sensory neurons with virus that's been grown in these cells so that it has a um, cross-linkable. Cross-linkable means there's a chemical moiety in the protein. And if the two proteins are close enough and you add your, your cross-linker, they will become covalently bound to each other. Right. And in the case of of dyne kinesin, they need to be able to, to move freely in order to walk. So when you cross-link them, you let the air out of the brakes and the whole thing comes to the stop. <clears throat> and they can see it stops the particles from getting uh, near the nucleus, right? Because uh, these are normal cells and the virus has kinesin in it. So it should go all the way to the nucleus, but they're cross-linking it to stop it. So this really beautifully proves that you need kinesin to get into the nucleus. It's great. Um, Let's see. Are there any other experiments? That's the, those are the experiments. The thing about these uh, papers, you can't tell when the discussion begins. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> well, you can't tell when the introduction begins either because it just launches right in. You know, they, they've got like one yeah. sentence of introduction and then. <laughs> I've, you know, I've learned that it's, the abstract is really the introduction. Yeah. Because right? then in the first sentence, it's to test this hypothesis. Yes. I mean, well, what hypothesis? <laughs> And so now that's the last experiment, and they start talking, and after a while you see there's no more data, so you assume you're, you're in the, the discussion. discussion. Right. So they call this, uh, so they say, to our knowledge, you know, nobody's ever seen incorporation of a motor into a particle, and they say we refer to this as assimilation. I would have so called it theft. 
But, you know, maybe that's the new term. It's like person of interest for suspect. Assimilation. It's like interrogation. It's yeah. just a, a word that's going to be with. I don't have a problem with assimilation. That's it's okay. just, uh, I mean, I would have said incorporation into the particle, right? Yeah. It's too I guess many it's words. longer. Yeah. I mean, we know of other cellular proteins that get into virus particles. Yeah. But yeah. this is the first time that they've seen this happen a motor, for a motor. Right? Yeah. So what I wondered is, I guess they don't have enough of it there for them to be able to say, but are we assuming that this is going into the tegument? I mean, is that the only place it could go? Or the reason I asked is, mm. um, where's their pictures? Oh, yeah. So there are pictures in that uh, extended data figure. You know, it's outside of the icosahedral shape, but I yeah. guess it could still be within the envelope. So that would put it in the tegument, right? Yeah. But re remember, the envelope is left behind at the plasma membrane. Right. So if it's going to travel with the part with the capsid, it's got to be in the tegument, I think. Although I don't know that they showed us that right by any kind of fluorescence i don't we i don't recall that well maybe the beta lactamase that's no, gonna the particles be are too small yeah it's particles gonna be hard to get down to that scale with the available assay but i think that's yeah in their summary figure that's where they put it yeah yeah, yeah that's and a logical just, place for it because it, it can't be certainly can't be internal to the capsid it's got to be able to grab on and then function as a motor and the tegument is the place to put it. And so, that seems like that would be the place where there's space. Yes. yes. For, I yes. mean, thinking of the picture in principles of virology of all those different colored molecules that are in the tegument in the, of the herpes virus. Yeah. So one thing I didn't get, because I don't know the transport field, that they say dynine can only get you to the centrosome. And they say kinesin gets from the centrosome to the nucleus, which doesn't make any sense to me because kinesin is supposed to go the other way, right? So is there some situation where kinesin can go? I guess kinesin I can guess go that it's last mile, reversible, right? yeah. Because they say, um, we, you know, dynine explains how particles are delivered long distances in neurons, right? But doesn't account for how they arrive at the nucleus and kinesin is the solution. But I wouldn't have thought that because I thought, I I'm reading this, I'm going, wait a minute, how does that <laughs> work? Kinesis, so I guess it's uh, a little, um, um, it's it's not black and white, right? It's beyond me. Either the motor yeah, is reversible <laughs> or the tubules, the microtubules polarity, some of them is the other way. Yeah, because if you don't have kinesin, the particles stop yeah. at the center. So oh, yeah. I, I mean, the data are very clear here. If you, you definitely doesn't bring it. Kinesin. So if anyone's listening who knows why is kinesin doing the centrosome to nuclear shunt, right. <laughs> I thought it would go the other way. It's, it's, uh, it's odd. Anyway, so that's pretty cool. I think it's a nice uh, discovery. Yeah. Now, ads don't add and add no, uh, Kathy. The hexon binds the motor, right? Is that what binds it? Uh, I guess so. Yeah, to get I'm it. So, the one getting in would be dynein, and then oh, so here's the, the other part of the adenovirus. Then, at some point, when it's docked on the nuclear pore, then kinesin starts to pull it the other way, and that's thought to contribute to pull the, it apart, pull, pulling it apart. Yeah. Yeah, so herpes actually steals a motor and uses that mm -hmm. to get in. Steals it from the previous herpes cell. Herpes steals a motor, yeah. yeah. It steals it from the previous cell, yeah. that's right. Mm -hmm. And when you were talking about whether uh, how many it needed to steal, I was just thinking about, well, it depends on how many horsepower the motor yes. is. Yes, that's right. <laughs> yes. yes. The dependence of these viruses on assimilated kinesin I guess assimilate is a nice one word yeah. way to say that. Indicates that the abundant kinesin motors encountered upon any cell are insufficient to effectively traffic these viruses to nuclei. Why, though? Why? I, I don't know why they would be uh, insufficient if they're know. abundant, right? Yeah. Anyway, it clearly, it clearly has to come in with it. 
Yeah, I'd like to know what's the reason for that, right? I'm sure the um, authors um, have have more conjecture on this, but it wouldn't fit. <laughs> yeah, it's too bad. You know, it's always good to be able to have a nice discussion in your paper, yeah. but they're, they're so compressed because they make yeah. still a paper version of nature, right? Yeah. 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 <laughs> they do. <laughs> Kathy's got it. Well, I mean, you can print out what's online, but you know, they also weren't able to explain, you know, things in their figure, like the different colors of the Kinesin molecules in the cartoons and the mm -hmm. final one, the, the reddish ones are the ones that are assimilated and the yellow ones are sort of the endogenous ones that, that aren't good enough to help you have to have the stolen one to help right. and, and that sort of thing. Yeah. Oh, you know what? Um, so the, I think this is the answer. And the, the, so the microtubules have polarity, yeah. right? The plus end is by the plasma membrane and the minus end is at the centrosome. But from the centrosome, the plus end is at the nucleus. So oh. that's why kinesin, it's just doing the polarity it's from thing. the centrosome to the, yes. Okay. The nucleus is minus the plus, just like from the centrosome to the plasma membrane is minus the plus. So kinesin okay. isn't doing anything different. No, okay. It's so are you hypothesizing that or do you know that about the I, centrosome it, to the nucleus? Here in their picture, they have the polarity of the microtubules oh. indicated oh. and the, the, the nuclear end is plus. Got right. it. Got it. And the part yeah. that's coming from the plasma membrane has a minus at the end of it, right near the centrosome. So I bet that's right. what explains. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. Just so much packed into each yes. little part of this paper. So for those of you who have gotten lost, so the herpes <laughs> viruses move on tracks in cells to get in and out. And w what they have shown is that it actually steals a motor, one of these motors, from the cell where it's produced to help it get to the nucleus. Yeah. That's the bottom line. So what other viruses could do this? Um, oh, you say, well, the herpes, many of the herpes viruses, but what about other families? Baculoviruses? <laughs> Might be. How about rabies viruses, envelope that are neurotropic, neuroinvasive? Yeah. Mm. Mm. For you thinking of it from that standpoint. I don't know if... Uh, I was just thinking about things that could move, yeah. move to the nucleus. To the yeah, nucleus, it doesn't have yeah. to be neuroinvasive. That's right. It could right. just be gone to the nucleus. Anyway, very cool. Yeah. Good stuff. And, mm -hmm. and other proteins might be stolen too. I mean... Assimilated. Assimilated. I like stolen better. It's just more <laughs> evocative. Um, yeah, so this... So, so and one of the... I wanted you, you guys to tell me the last sentence of the abstract. This principle of viral assimilation may may prove relevant to other virus families and offers new strategies to combat infection. <laughs> so, are you saying you're going to inhibit this motor specifically? But it's kinesin; it's the same protein yeah. that's in a cell. Yeah, Wouldn't that be don't an inhibit issue? my kinesin? No. <laughs> well, if you can. <laughs> Figure out some way to block the kinesin UL36 interaction. Yeah, if you can, it, it does give you another aspect of viral biology. I mean, the, that last little bit there is just for the next grant. Um, it, it also seems like a, it has not escaped our notice that. <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> Somewhere they said that, didn't they? <laughs> yes. I don't know, but Watson and Crick did. Yes. People like to say that, oh, I, I, I want to find it because I, I read it and I said, "Oh, come on! You can't re, you can't repurpose Watson and Crick. Where is that? Where is it?" Mm. Hmm. They may not have said that. I don't think you they think? did. I'm not finding it. Uh, they said something similar that kind of rang a bell, but I'll find it another time. Okay. All right. That's very nice. Very nice. A little break from. COVID. Yeah. Uh, let's do a couple of emails here. And before you do, just to point out that um, Greg Smith was on TWIV 378, Herpes Place Dubstep. I pasted it in the notes. And the, the link has the, the really cool show image that you made, Vincent. Yeah. Oh, and it shows the, the herpes virus with all the different colored tegument proteins inside oh. the earphones. 
Remember that? Oh my gosh. Just hover over the 378 in the show notes and you'll see it. I see. Herpes plays dubstep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I put the earphones over the... That's when I was just starting to make um, images. Now no, I just made them. them a long time before that. You've, you've been putting together I images think. a while. Yeah. Greg Smith. Yep. That was February 2016. This is... Um, yeah, I remember that dub is a deubiquitinase, remember? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Cool. All right. Um, Okay, let's do some email. Kathy, can you take uh, the first one, please? Sure. Lori writes, Hi, Twivers. Writing from Tomball, not Buda, Texas, where it is 81 Fahrenheit, 27.2 Celsius. I've been listening to Twiv podcast from the autumn of 2014 and find it very interesting hearing the conversations around the Ebola outbreak, especially in light of today's situation. Discussions about PPE, quarantine, treatments and vaccines, how important understanding the route of infection and other properties of the virus is in protecting people. Going back to even earlier episodes, I'm curious to know if the group of people who are against the gain-of-function research with H7 and 9 are the same who were against BSL-4 labs and are also the same group who believe that the SARS-CoV-2 same group who believe the SARS-CoV-2 lab leak theory. My intention is not to create controversy. I just want to get the facts straight. Also, I came across a paper in Nature Medicine about dexamethasone mechanism in treatment for severe COVID-19 and differences in men and women. I would love to hear you discuss on either Immune or TWIV. And uh, Lori put the link into a Nature article. Thank you all, Lori. So I haven't looked at this article. It's called Dexamethasone Modulates Immature Neutrophils and Interfering Programming in Severe covid so that is an immune paper for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think I, I have seen this. It looks good. Um, yeah, they're the same people. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, I, the names are exactly the same. Mm -hmm. And I'm not going to name them because they know who they are, but the same people who made a stink about H5N1, H7N9, BSL4 labs are the same ones making a stink now. Which makes sense because they are they want this to have come from a lab because then it would validate the argument they were making about how dangerous this research is. So that's what's going yeah, on. Yeah, that's right. Alan. Jeannie writes, Dear Vincent, I've been reading Principles of Virology. I made it through Volume 2. I have dipped into your streaming lectures to help with Volume 1. I received these books from you after having been declared the third prize winner in the TWIV Pandemic Poetry Contest. Thanks so much. Here is Pandemic Poem Number 2. Pandemic vaccines rejected, alas, and the end of the pandemic did not come to pass. Delta arrived with its lightning hit, proving itself a variant more fit. Up and down, up and down went the deaths and the cases, as some of us hid with our masks on our faces. Others pretended it was nothing at all, as Delta ravaged the nation into the fall. Vaccine mandates arrived and brought their own strife. Why fight against something that, you can, that can save your life? The days seem dark, yet we're still looking for light. With science and patience, we may yet get it right. Hmm. Thanks for all you th you and the team do, Jeannie. All right. Thank you, Jeannie. I love it. It's very nice. Good. Yeah, good poem. I love the first two lines, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. ah. Yeah, I still have a, a stack of books I never mailed out um, to some winners. So if you won and I, you didn't get the book, let me know because um, <laughs> I can find who you are, but it would be easier if you just – Told me. Just send the because, address, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Ethan writes, Dear Twivers, it's a wonderful, cloudy, misty 14C November day here in Ann Arbor, Michigan. <laughs> I picked up on Twiv at the start of the pandemic, and you all have been my guiding light throughout. I teach middle school, so it's been an interesting up and down and all over the place kind of pandemic. Very much like other pandemics, I suppose. It's been a comfort to listen to Twiv in order to get clarity on the science. I did get a booster, Vincent, but I have middle schoolers breathing on me all day long, so I figured it couldn't hurt. Forgive me. <laughs> don't, don't say forgive no, me. No, no, no. Go get, go get your booster. You can, do, you can get yeah, your booster. That's it's fine. fine. Anyway, I teach a lot of writing, and I'm most interested in storytelling as a way of communicating. 
One of my favorite episodes is TWIV 827 with Greg Zuckerman. I, a side note, my mother-in-law, Kathy Welch, is a retired University of Michigan biostatistician. So I've been able to get Christmas present recommendations for, for her from TWIV the, the last few years. Pox Americana was a good one. Thanks, Kathy Spindler. My second favorite, Kathy, who is also a Wolverine. I am a wait, Spartan. So wait. It's, I'm not a Wolverine. <laughs> I work at the University of Michigan, but I'm a boiler maker. Okay. Why why would you think you're a Wolverine? Well, just because I'm here. Oh, so you it's can't like, you don't uh, identify with Wolverines. I, I don't in particular, no. <laughs> if it had been some other school not in the Big 10 maybe, but yeah. <laughs> you've already got your identity fixed. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right, I'm a Spartan, so it's tough for me to love Wolverines, but I digress. <laughs> Zuckerman's book, now it's not so tough, so you don't have to worry, is my liter- is in my literati cart, local bookstore in Ann Arbor, and will be one of her gifts this year. That's not you, the other Kathy, I guess, right? Right, right. I loved your discussion with Mr. Zuckerman for so many reasons, and I plan to read the book myself as well. To get to the point, I reach out to you to share a funny tidbit. I couldn't get his book to show up in my search on the Literati website, so I did a quick Amazon search to correct my mistakes and use the correct query. I've attached a screenshot of what came up on Amazon. Please note the category in which Amazon has put Mr. Zuckerman's book, Welding, (laughs) and it's the number one bestseller to boot. Maybe he can explain. That's all, folks. Have fun. Be well. Keep doing what you're doing. I very much appreciate you. Um, (laughs) <laughs> I don't know. Maybe it's a mistake that it's that in welding. That is probably right? a mistake. Amazon sometimes does funny things with categories. Yeah. I have funny stories about the um, UGA bookstore and uh, Feynman books and where they were categorized. But um, Literati is a really good bookstore in Ann Arbor. I was just there the other day. Oh, yeah? And, yeah. And they also have a typewriter in the downstairs part of the store, and and people can go in and type things. And so they made a book of the things that people have typed on there, and uh, you can follow the typewriter on Twitter. Oh, cute. It's, it's can be, it can hmm. be pretty poignant, uh, things cool. that people have That's written neat. about. Yeah. So I just went to Zuckerman on Amazon, and indeed, it's in the welding category. It's a number one bestseller in welding. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Well, he's not going to know either why that is, so that's yeah. just a mistake. Uh, Kathy. Anthony writes, Hi, TWIV team. I just finished listening to episode 829, where at the end of the episode, there was discussion about how all published papers in nature are wrong in a sense. The hosts go on to explain how not all science is wrong, but the details in most papers can be wrong. I'm currently finishing my master's degree in biology with the hopes of teaching undergraduates, and this is something I would love to be able to explain to them in detail. Can you elaborate a bit more on this? (laughs) Thanks for all you do. And while I love when all the stars are together, duet episodes are something special. Best, Anthony. So how the details in most papers can be wrong. Well, and not all the details in any one paper are necessarily wrong. but Just some part of it, right? We don't know know everything. And do you know what this comes from, Kathy and Alan? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I may have been on that episode. Okay. Um, but yeah, I mean, the gist of it is that when people write a paper, they write it with the knowledge they have at the time. And so they will say something and they can say it with more uncertainty or less uncertainty. Yeah. You know, they might say the data suggest that or the data indicate that or the data prove that. They don't usually say that. But um, And so those kinds of things might turn out to not be the case when we find out more information. Yeah. So that's so that's one reason why the details might be might be wrong. And so if people yeah. are if people have hypotheses then not every aspect of their hypothesis is probably going to be true. There will be something in the details that is different from what they imagine or hypothesize. Yeah. yeah I mean even today's paper there may be some aspect that doesn't pan out, right? Sure. So that's, I think that's all the nature editor meant. Mm-hmm. They're all wrong. It's kind of a, you know, it's a way of saying that there, there are aspects of it. He didn't mean it's all wrong. Though. No. Right. They're all wrong in their each individual way. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Alan. 
Uh, let's see. So that was Anthony. Um, Tyler writes, hello, Twiv. I am a lowly pre-doctoral fellow working in a biophysical chemistry lab in Atlanta, Georgia. I started watching your show because I'm seeking to get my doctorate in virology. My question may be a change of pace from your typical questions. I have concerns regarding the ethics of the paper visualizing in deceased COVID-19 patients how SARS-CoV-2 attacks the respiratory and olfactory mucosae but spares the olfactory bulb. When would the researchers pursue consent for their procedure? If they asked patients in the hospital, could the act of asking for consent impact the probability of death? Maybe the stress of thinking of their death. I would like to see data comparing the percentage of deaths in the treatment group to comparable individuals elsewhere. Do you think this concern is valid? Thank you for your, the thought-provoking commentary and exciting discussions. Respectfully, Tyler. Um, I wouldn't be too concerned about that. I, I don't think that people who are in the hospital with a severe illness who have somebody come in and ask them, you know, in the event of your death, would you be willing to consent to this experiment? I don't think that's going to make them die. Um, it seems like a bit of a stretch. Um, I, it's not a, it's not a completely silly concern. I mean, yes, you might affect somebody's mental state and that could in turn affect their, their physical state. Um, I don't know. I, um, my stepfather had an experience. He had a long series of health problems, but uh, he actually at one point was was lying in a hospital room and was in rough shape. And the, the doctors stepped out and a, a moment later, a priest came in and started uh, administering what was then known as last rites. Um, now I think it's called something like blessing of the sick. Um, and, and Al said, what are you doing? And the, the priest was rather startled because he didn't realize this was a still quite a live patient. And he explained it and... Uh, um, that the doctors had suggested he do this. Um, but, um, and that was 20 years before Al died. So it didn't seem to affect him very much. Um, but I don't know, I would not heard this raised as a concern before about postmortem studies. I've had family members years ago have surgery and they always got last rites. Okay. If you wanted, I mean, it was a priest. So you, if you don't want a priest, that's fine, but. No, this was something I that I think the doctors had initiated. Like, uh, Oh, I see. Yeah, that was why he was started. But, what if the patient is unconscious, you know, in an ICU, they, then their medical directive goes to the whoever signed it, right? And they could make that decision yeah. for them, right? But I guess the question is, why do they need to get consent if some, if it's after someone has died? Maybe you could explain that. I Do they? I don't know. It I, says, I'm not entirely I thought, sure. I thought this was the case where they did get consent. yes. Before they died, okay. so that they could very quickly get the samples, right, without going through additional okay. hoops or whatever. So it seems a little bit to me like, you know, if a tree falls in the forest and is there someone there to hear it or not? It's kind of like, well, if you bring this up, does that change the outcome? And maybe, but I agree with you, Alan. I suspect that it's not a, a serious. Thing. And I, I certainly don't think it's not ethical um, because this person said they have concerns about the ethics. Um, you know, if you've ever consented to the slightest little procedure, they go through all the possibilities and one of them is always death, yes. you know? Yeah. So You're having your wind wisdom teeth pulled and this could result in death, yes. Yeah, um, so. So according to the NIH, even after death, formal consent from a surrogate is required for medical right, procedures yeah. such as organ donation and autopsy. Right, of course. Yeah. So here, as Kathy said, you're doing it ahead of time so you can quickly get yeah. samples, right? So you don't have, have to go to, to the grieving family and get permission from them. You already got it yeah. from the patient. Yeah. So anything involving patient samples, you need to get medical yeah. consent. And that's why we, did, we didn't always have such regulations. And that's why HeLa cells, yeah. you know. Were taken without consent, but we don't do that anymore. Yeah. All right. Karen writes, so, hello, Team Twiv. I'm in Marietta, Georgia. It's cold out. I wanted to tell you that I'm participating in the Marietta City Schools Test and Stay Program. My daughter was sent home on a Wednesday for close contact. The school district op offers rapid tests every morning. So on Thursday, we did that. It was positive. So we went to the district's PCR testing location and did that. 
Her test was positive. Mine was not. By the time we were on the way home, my son was ready for pickup from school. He got to be tested in the middle of last week and returned to school on Friday. My daughter returned to school today. She had no signs or symptoms. Thank God it was nice out so we could walk and stuff each day. She was climbing the walls, all of them. Those little fingers are great at gripping molding. <laughs> anyway, here's where you come in. When the school district called for their epidemiology questions, I answered. When the Cobb Douglas Health Department called, I, I wanted to say, ask me anything. I listen to TWIV. <laughs> I want you to have as much information as possible. There's a project between the school district and the CDC as well, and I gladly answer those questions. I'm fully vaccinated, but the kids are 11 and 6, so they haven't had the shot yet. During this last week, she was supposed to stay to isolate quarantine and stay away from her brother. It was easier for us if he stayed in his room. That's the big winner here. Ten-year-olds who get basically unlimited access to Minecraft because their sister has a positive test. <laughs> and Mags is pretty mischievous. She'd sit outside his door, knock, and pretend to cough and tell him that she was going to COVID you. <laughs> Kids, we are well, thank God. Thanks for all you do, and I hope that you would be happy to see that there are school districts out there that are taking an aggressive testing and vaccination approach. Karen, yes, Excellent. I'm glad to hear it because often we just get the bad news for the ones that don't, yeah. right? And um, my wife just signed the consent for my daughter to reveal her face in school um, starting next week. They, uh, the, the school she goes to has an 80% vaccination rate, above 80% vaccination rate. And so Massachusetts is allowing schools that meet that criterion to, um, uh, to make masks optional for kids who are fully vaccinated. <clears throat> So very good. Yeah. All right. We have one more. Let's do it, Kathy. Paula writes, hi, all. I'm writing from Okinawa where it is 30 Celsius, but due to the humidity feels like 36. It's lovely just the same when you can go jump in the sea to cool off. While the weather is nice, the outlook for the pandemic is not great here. We're in a state of emergency until the end of September, at least. Sigh. I'm a longtime pre-pandemic listener and supporter and really, really, really appreciate you. I teach undergraduate college bi biology courses as a military contractor for the Air Force and use the information and resources you provide to design activities for my students. I also enjoy your picks. They keep me smiling. If I can, ex if I can suggest one of my own, it would be Reasons to be Cheerful, an email newsletter started by Dave and Byrne of Talking Heads fame. It provides a balance to the usual fare, news for when you've had too much news. And he puts in the link. I just listened to your latest episode with Shane Crotty, great stuff, and the rant by Charles about the lack of support for antigen testing, and Richard's story about his daughter in London and the easy availability of antigen tests there. I too am stunned that the antigen tests aren't being manufactured en masse and distributed freely. This topic is very timely for me because my husband and I are traveling this fall for the first time since the pandemic began. We're coming to the U.S. to see both of our aging moms, one 87, the other 93. In order to fly, we will get PCR tests before flying and, of course, are vaccinated. We know that there is no testing on entry to the U.S. and want to do antigen tests to be sure we don't pick up covid on the way and potentially expose the moms. We look for tests online on US sites like Amazon, Walgreens, Walmart, et cetera, to no avail. The only options were to purchase large packs at 1,200 to 5,000 each. We then popped down to the local drugstore and bought them there. Thank goodness. My husband continued to search online and finally found five tests, which he quickly purchased. The tests here in Japan cost $40, while the ones from the US are $20. So harder to find in the US, but cheaper when you do find them. We plan to test when we land before seeing the family, and if we're negative, we will feel confident hanging out with the moms. We'll be masking in public and otherwise not exposing ourselves to large crowds once there. To my question, once there, does it make more sense to test every day for three days straight, or would testing every other day over a longer time be okay? I understand that a positive antigen test lets you know you're infected and possibly transmitting, while a negative test doesn't say anything about infection, just that you probably don't have a high enough load to transmit. She really got it. Yeah. This is great. <laughs> Since it takes about three days from initial infection to transmissibility, would testing every other day be adequate? I'd appreciate your insight. 
As an aside, when we return to Japan, we'll get a PCR test before flying, get a rapid test on arrival at the airport in Tokyo, courtesy of the Japanese government, and then go into ROM, restriction of movement, meaning we have to stay on a military installation for 14 days, then get tested again before being allowed off base. I just thought you'd be interested in the protocol here as opposed to the U.S. And if you're a Japanese citizen in quarantine, the government sends you care packages of food and water to tide you over. Japan initially seemed to have a handle on the situation, but as you know, is now in a grip. I think that at least on Okinawa, the previously lax attitude of the military here on the island has contributed to the spread. The lack of a coordinated strategic plan among the branches of the military has surprised me, and I wonder sometimes how we manage to even feed ourselves. Things are looking up now that the vaccines are getting FDA approval. Well, you all take care. Thank you again for so, so much for the podcast. I so enjoy listening to your thoughts and thought processes and also love the weekly picks. My mom, who was a pilot, is the happy recipient of cockpit videos, especially the women. She was a bit of a loner back in the day and loves to see these women flying with such skill and joy. Thanks, Alan. Oh, which reminds me of another pick that my mom turned me on to, a great book called The Night Witches by Bruce Miles. Best wishes and many thanks for all the good you're doing, Paula. So that's another listener pick, The Light. The night, the night witches, witches, or is that is that a pick, yeah. pick we've had before? I, I haven't heard it. No, but okay. we'll put it on hers. Yeah. So back to her question: um, If tests are scarce and they're ten to twenty dollars a piece, um, and you want to space them to every other day, that seems like a reasonable approach. But thinking about on the day when you haven't tested, you might have turned positive to a level of being able to transmit that day. So, yeah, they should be a lot cheaper, a lot more readily available. And yeah, yeah. Daniel always says, um, don't just do one do, right. because they come in packs of two or they can come in packs of two. So do both right. of them. But uh, right. yeah, I think a day or two. Every right. Other day and is fine. and yeah. I if I remember correctly, he said do the second one on the day when you're going to see the elderly parents yeah. or the vulnerable people, whatever it is. Um, do it that day if possible. Yep. Yeah. Oh, I went to a Broadway show on Friday. Oh. Oh. Cool. What did you see? Moulin Rouge. Oh. Oh, nice. But Very good. Just I mean, it was amazing. If you ever have the opportunity, it is, and I'm not a big fan of musicals, but blew my mind away. Um, the procedure, right? You get in line. There's a guy come and he checks your vaccine. Well, we have an app in New York. You have to show an ID and then the vaccine card on it, right? And then there's a metal detector and then everybody's wearing masks and they have people walking around. And if you're not wearing a mask, they shine a light on you. <laughs> In the theater. <laughs> and of course, the talent on stage not wearing masks, but I assume they're tested extensively, right? Yeah, they're probably tested every day. Yeah. But, you know, um, it's almost as if there wasn't a pandemic except for the masks, right? Yeah. Because <laughs> the seats were all full. There's no spacing whatsoever. There's no distancing. And um, uh, it was really good. <laughs> So, all uh, right, let's do some picks of the week. Kathy, what do you have for us? Uh, this is thanks to Christiana, but I, I had seen it too, but I hadn't looked at it in depth until she pointed it out. It's a pearl from Plus Pathogens, which is an open access journal. The title is The Power of Poop, Defecation Behaviors and Social Hygiene in Insects. And it's short. Most Plus Pathogens pearls are short. And the gist of it is... Um, how uh, feeding and defecation are important to social insects. Insects practice fecal distancing. <laughs> um, sociality and beneficial relationships, uh, they have sociality and beneficial relationships with feces. Uh, they can use feces for nest sanitation and gut health, so that's protective. I'm just reading the headers here. Uh, weaponized poop, uh, the antimicrobial potential potential of feces uh, and uh, future work. So uh, it's uh, as I said, it's a short article. It's got a, a nice uh, diagram 
and you all can check it out. And it's good that Alan's here today because I know insects are one of his things. <laughs> insects and poop, yes. Yeah, <laughs> this is this is great. And I love the graphic where they, they've got different um, you social, subsocial, and solitary um, and and then what kinds of how they use their poop um, mm -hmm. and ballistic frass ejection is shown on there, which is one of my favorite mechanisms. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Excellent. Alan, what do you have for us? I have a book I just finished reading recently. Um, this is Under the Sky We Make by um, Kimberly Nicholas, who is a prominent climate researcher. Um, <clears throat> and she realized she'd been giving, she'd been, you know, doing research on climate change and giving talks about climate change for uh, for years. And really, there were some aspects of it that needed to be discussed in more depth. Um, <clears throat> she is also uh, someone whose name came up in the news a few years ago. She was one of the authors on a paper that um, um, analyzed the, <clears throat> pardon me, the most effective steps that people, individuals could take to cut their climate footprint. Um, and the, the three big ones that they identified were, um, fly less, you know, fewer airline trips, um, eat, uh, more plant oriented diet rather than meat, uh, and drive less. So fairly, actually fairly simple things. Um, what drew so much coverage of that paper, unfortunately, was one of their other findings, which they tried to phrase carefully, but, um, their data also showed that um, having less one less child um, drastically reduced your carbon footprint uh, more so than any of the other three things. Um, and they, all sorts of accusations were made about them and their beliefs and such as a result of that, even though that's just what the data showed. Anyway, this book is about balancing what we do as humans with um, what, what kind of future we want to make for the planet. Um, then it's dealing with big, significant issues and how we address them and how we think about them and frame them. And um, actually is one of the few books about climate change that I've read that's um, hopeful. I mean, she starts out with the bad news and the bad news is really, really bad. And then she points out, you know, we can fix it. The good part of this is that we can, we can make this better um, but it does require individual action because governments are not going to be fast enough and individual action is going to drive market changes <clears throat> and social changes that will actually get us to a solution. So really good book. Highly mm -hmm. recommend. Cool. All right. So this is the end of my 10 installment series of seminal papers in uh, molecular biology. And I had... You know, this was tough because I don't have any more choices. <laughs> this is it. And there's so many more I could pick. But um, I thought it should be PCR, polymerase chain reaction. Yeah. And uh, this is a checkered history, right? It's um, very contentious about who figured out what. In fact, there's a nice history. It's called the discovery of PCR, the procurement of divine power by uh, Jonathan Kaunitz who notes that the origins are somewhat murky given the dispute over its provenance. What's not disputed is that PCR would not have been possible without the pioneering work of others, DNA structure, DNA polymerase discovery. Actually, that was a, that was a candidate for a seminal discovery, DNA polymerase discovery. Um, the synthesis of nucleotides, corona, and so forth. Anyway, uh, the paper that is cited is um, a science paper from 1985, Enzymatic Amplification of Beta-Globin Genomic Sequences and Restriction Site Analysis for Diagnosis of Single-Cell Anemia. And so this is the description of uh, polymerase chain reaction. Of course, Carrie Mullis received the Nobel Prize uh, for that. Um, he, uh, he thought it up in 1983. He was working as a chemist at Cetus Corporation and then uh, this paper was published a number of, it says after they got the patent stuff sorted out, then they published the paper, <laughs> right? Um, and so since then, a lot of 
changes have occurred to make it really accessible. And so PCR, there's just so many things that it's used for, right? It is just every time you talk about a PCR, <laughs> COVID diagnosis, we use it in the lab all the time. It's used uh, to make genes and so forth. Just a really remarkable technique. And if you, you know, in, in Mullis's Nobel address, he thought of this, you know, the, the story goes, he was uh, driving with his girlfriend and he thought of this and he said, how could, how can it be? No one else has thought of this. This is just too straightforward. And so he just went and did it. And, uh, he, and that, so I think that's, uh, that's an important one. Yeah. And many years later, I sat next to Carrie Mullis at an ASM dinner. Hmm. He was an interesting fellow. That's <laughs> one way of putting for sure. it. Yeah, for sure. And of course, sadly, he died not too long yeah. ago. Um, and not that old. So um, here you have it, 10, 10 seminal papers. Car give or Carrie take Mullis a few, had right? one great idea and a lot of not so great ideas. <laughs> it happens, yeah. right? Some of us are lucky to have one great yeah, idea. Yeah, exactly. All right. So we had two listener picks from Paula. Oh, actually, the first one, did we read, did we read that? Yes. I don't remember. Reasons to be cheerful. Kathy? Mm -hmm. You read it, Kathy, yeah. right? Okay, mm -hmm. from David Byrne. And um, then The Night Witches by Bruce Miles. And then Grant writes, uh, my question, is it possible that SARS-CoV-2 virus is both naturally occurring and also leaked from a lab? Are the two mutually exclusive or can it be both? Can a natural virus leak from a lab or is that impossible? Uh, SARS-CoV-2 came from nature, but in theory it would be possible for a natural virus to come out of a lab. So SARS-1, after it had been discovered and grown in the lab, it infected someone uh, the next year. You know, you're growing high titer stocks and uh, yeah. But um, that didn't get out and start a pandemic. It already was an outbreak. But um, so it is possible, but didn't happen with this virus. Okay, my comment, I've been listening since March 2020, and every time you plug Dixon's website, you say it wrong. You always say livingriver.com, but it's actually livingriver.org. You always say it with .com, and Dixon never corrects you. You should know this since you helped them set up the website, <laughs> and you got Dixon's name wrong, okay? Yes. <laughs> it's D-I-C-K-S-O-N, not – there's no X in it. I just can't remember. I can't remember it's .com or .org. Why? Because I don't go there all the time. <laughs> And I'm 68, and I don't remember things. <laughs> well, and you can probably start typing the Living River into your computer, and it finishes and, filling it out, so you don't have to right. figure it out. Autofill kills memory. That's right. My listener picked Dixon picked George Carlin's stuff in a previous twiv, and you have also said you like George Carlin too. So my listener pick is George Carlin Germs Immune System. <laughs> it's a six minute bit that is on topic. Oh, that's cool. I didn't know that. Cool. I will go check it out. I do like George. Carlin. I think he's a funny yeah. guy. Brant is in Austin, Texas. All right. That is TWIV833. Uh, you can find the show notes at microbe.tv slash TWIV. Please send us your questions and comments, TWIV at microbe.tv. And don't forget, um, if you'd like to donate to parasiteswithoutborders.com, <laughs> you can go there. There's a button that says donate. They'll match your donation and give it back to Microbe TV. If you're already donating to Microbe TV, it is now tax deductible, federal tax deductible in the U.S. Alan Dove is at alandove.com. Alan Dove on Twitter. Thanks, Alan. Thank you. It's always a pleasure. Kathy Spindler is at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. Thank you, Kathy. Thanks. This was a lot of fun. I'm Vincent Rack in yellow. You can find me at virology.ws. I'd like to thank the American Society for Virology and the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIV and Ronald Jenkins for the music. I hope all of you have a great holiday here in the U.S. or wherever you're celebrating Thanksgiving. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back soon. Another TWIV is viral. <laughs>